Good morning. I am so glad to be here again with you guys. Welcome back to another Sunday School Online. I hope you all have had a wonderful, wonderful week. And my table's a little shaky. Okay. Anyway, we've been learning about the life of Jesus over the last several months. And we, we're going to continue to do that for a few more weeks. We've been zooming in on Jesus' life from the very beginning of it. In fact, from a little bit before the beginning of his life. And right now we're looking at... If I can find a good spot for my phone here. Right now we're looking at the early part of Jesus' ministry. The time when Jesus first started going out and preaching and doing all of these wonderful things to show the people around him who God was and what God was going to do and was doing for them and for his people. We, we learned last week about Jesus' first miracle, and that was one of our buzzwords last week. Do you remember what that word even means, the word miracle? A miracle is something good that only God can do. And our other buzzword for last week was disciple. It wasn't a new buzzword, but it, it's one that comes up every once in a while. And it just means someone who is following Jesus. In last week's lesson, Jesus and his disciples were at a wedding, and Jesus performed a miracle, his very first miracle. And by doing that, he showed his power and his love. He showed his power just by the fact that he was able to do something impossible. And his, he showed his love by doing it to help the people around him. And we're going to keep on learning about that power and love. But before we do dive into today's story, let's take a minute to pray. Father God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for being a God who loves us. Thank you for being a God who uses your power to show us your love. Thank you for being a God who does everything so that we will want to be with you again. Father God, we ask that you would make yourself felt today. We ask that your spirit would open our hearts and our minds to you today. And Father God, we ask that you would fill each of us with your peace and with a deep sense of who we are in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to John chapter 3. That's where we're going to be today. And we're going to be learning about a story that many of you have probably heard already. It's the story of Nicodemus. So go ahead and open up your Bibles with me to John chapter 3. Sometimes we learn completely new stories, like yesterday's story was probably new to many of you. But today's story is probably one that you've heard before, and I know today's memory verse is one that you've heard before. But sometimes it's important to be reminded of the things that we already know. In fact, tomorrow afternoon, I'll be on here again with a little bit about why reminders are important and why distractions are such a problem and take us away from the things that we already know. So John chapter 3, starting in verse 1, says a certain man, a Pharisee, and that's our first buzzword for today, Pharisee. That's one of the groups that was ruling the Jewish people. It's kind of like how we have pastors today, how we have elders and deacons. There were similar things. They had similar roles of teaching the people, showing the people who God was. And one of those groups was the Pharisees. Except, just like today, some of those people who are supposed to be showing who God is weren't doing a very good job of it. Some of them instead were going against Jesus himself. Well, there was one Pharisee, and we're going to learn about him today, who was trying to learn about Jesus. Now, a certain man, a Pharisee named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council, came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, there's our second buzzword already, Rabbi is just the Hebrew word for teacher, so there you go. Now you know a Hebrew word. Rabbi, teacher, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs that you do unless God is with him. Nicodemus understood that the fact that Jesus could do these things showed that God was with him. Do we understand that? Do we understand when we read the Bible that all the wonderful things that Jesus does show us that he comes from God? Nicodemus got that. And Jesus said to him, 
I tell you the truth, unless a person is born from above, he can't see the kingdom of God. Now, a lot of us might have the same question that Nicodemus had. He says, how can a man be born when he's already old? He can't, can't go back into his mother's womb and be born a second time, can he? Now, we've all seen babies. We know that babies are born, and then they grow up, and then all sorts of stuff happens throughout their life. But a baby's not going to go back and be born a second time. And that seemed really odd to Nicodemus, and it might seem odd to us, too. Jesus is saying that someone has to be born again to be a part of God's kingdom. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of God's kingdom. And so did Nicodemus. That's why he was there asking Jesus all these questions. But Jesus, Jesus went on to explain what he was saying. In fact, a lot of times Jesus does this. He doesn't leave us in the dark wondering what's going on. A lot of times Jesus does explain what he means. And he goes on to do that in verse 5. It says, Jesus answered, I tell you the solemn truth. Unless a person is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Jesus is saying, if you're born from your mother, from a human being, you're a human being, and that's great, that's part of who God created you to be, but that's not all that God created you to be. God created you and me to be born, to be a part of God, to have part of who God is, have God's image in us. Back in the Garden of Eden, when God first created man and woman, he made them to be like him in a lot of ways. And that is still what he wants for us. He wants us to be like him. And that's part of what he means when he talks about being born of water and of spirit. We, in the church today, we will often refer to that process to the beginning of that process, or at least a part of it, as baptism. That's the time when we say, yes, I want to be born again. I want to be a part of God's kingdom. And the way that we show that is through baptism. And then we continue to show that every day through the way that we live our lives by giving our lives over to God and letting God be the king. If we are in his kingdom, that means he is the king. He is the one who has control. He is the one who is in charge of our lives. But Nicodemus still didn't get it. He says, how can these things be? Jesus answered, you're a teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things. I tell you the truth. We speak about things that we know and testify. There's our third buzzword for this week, and I believe it's our last one. Third buzzword is testify. Now, testify is a word that just means we say what we know. We tell the truth. We say that this happened because it happened. We say that this is how it is because this is how it is. If you're going into a courtroom, for example, if someone is on trial, you'll have people who will come to testify, who will tell the truth about what they saw, about what they heard, about what they know, so that people can determine what is right and what is wrong, what actually happened in that case. And it's the same thing with Jesus. Jesus testifies to the truth about God. And we as his people testify to the truth about God. We say, this is what I know. This is what I've seen. This is what I've heard. This is what's happened in my own life. This is the truth. That's what it means to testify. We testify about what we have seen, but you people do not accept our testimony. If I had told you about earthly things, and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? Jesus would use a lot of parables. In fact, right there, he's talking about being born of water and of spirit. Now, spirits aren't born the way that human beings, like our body is born. Our body comes out of our mother's body. It's, that's how it works. It's not that way with the spirit. And God is saying, hey, I'm using a metaphor. I'm using an idea that you can understand so that you can understand something that's a little bit broader, a little bit bigger. Because the truth is, we're limited. My hands end right here. There's no going beyond that. Because we have these bodies, and they're amazing bodies. God made us just the way he wanted us to be. But the thing is, the spirit is different. The spirit is outside of that. Even And when our spirit is reborn... It's something that we can't completely understand. And so Jesus uses this idea of being born to that we can't understand to explain something that we can't. 
And he says, hey, I'm using an idea that you can understand. I hope you get it, because this is as good as it gets. Jesus uses clear language by using words and ideas that we already understand, and he explains things that we don't to help us understand the things that are bigger. Verse 13 says, No one has gone up into heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the Son of Man. So that's Jesus. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And Jesus is talking about himself there, and he uses again something that the people would understand to explain something bigger. He uses a story from Numbers, chapter 21. Now, we are actually learning about, we're actually learning about this pretty soon in Sunday school when we switch back to our, to our Old Testament studies. But it's a story in Numbers 21 where the people of God had just turned away from God. The, they hadn't even gotten to the promised land yet, and they had already given up on God's goodness and on God's love and on God's power. And they were complaining left and right. They were even complaining about the things that God had already done for them. And in the midst of their complaining, God told Moses, that's it. I'm done. These people are going to see what it's like when I'm not taking care of them, when I'm not protecting them. And so all of these, all of these poisonous snakes came up and started biting the people. And people were dying left and right from the diseases from these snakes. But God had mercy on them. God said, hey, that's enough. I am still here with my people. My people understand now that they need me again, and so I'm going to protect them again. I'm going to give them a way out. And so he told Moses, make a bronze serpent and put it up on a pole so that everyone can see it throughout the whole camp. And so Moses did that, and any time someone was bit by a poisonous snake, all that they had to do was look up to that bronze serpent on a pole, and they would be saved. They would be saved from the effects of that bite, but Jesus is using that story that the people would already know to say, hey, this is happening again. The Son of Man, Jesus, is going to be put up, in this case, not on a bronze pole, but on the cross. The Son of Man is going to be put up on a pole so that everyone who believes in him can still be saved, can have eternal life. Everyone who believes in him is going to be saved, not from the bites of snakes, but from the effects of our own sin from the effects of the fact that we have chosen to be apart from God. Because God does want us to be with him. He has always wanted that, and he always will want that. Verse 16 says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world should be saved through him. The one who believes in him is not condemned. The one who does not believe has been condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. And that is such a beautiful section of scripture right there. God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to this world. He sent his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish. And that's a buzzword that we've talked about in Sunday school before. It just means to die, but it takes it a step further, to die forever. Everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. He doesn't want us to die. He wants us to live forever with him, with the good things that he has for us, with the power and love that he shows us every day. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. A lot of people see the Bible and see Christians and see even Jesus as something that is there, as a group that is there, as someone who is there, and God himself as someone who is there, just to say, oh, you did something wrong. Bad, bad, bad. And that's just not how it is. He says in verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Now that means to say that that's it, that you're not worth saving, that you're done for. You're in trouble now. God did not send his son to do that. He sent his son to save the world, to save anyone who would accept him, anyone who would accept his salvation, anyone who would accept his power and his love. The one who believes in him is not condemned. The one who believes in Jesus 
It doesn't matter what we've done wrong. Jesus takes all of that away. The one who believes is not condemned. The one who believes that Jesus is the son of the living God, that he came to this world, that he lived and he died for you and me, and that on the third day, he rose to life again. He, he didn't stay dead. He came alive again and sent his spirit to live with us. The one who believes in those things is saved, is ha will have eternal life forever with God. This is, verse 19 goes on to say that this is why we can judge. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than light because the things they did were evil. You see, God judges not because he doesn't like us, not because he wants us to be away from him, but because we choose to be away from him. And he does give us that choice. He's not going to force us to be with him if we don't want to. And that's what Jesus is trying to teach Nicodemus, that we have to choose to want to be with God. God does everything that we need to be able to do that, to be able to choose him. But at the end of the day, he does let us choose. He won't force you and me to be with him. He won't force you and me to live the life he wants for us. But I can tell you for sure that the life that God wants for you and me might be hard sometimes, but it's 100% worth it. It's so much better than living our lives without him. And our verse for today, like I said at the beginning, is one that we've all heard before, and many of us already know it by heart. But again, like I said at the beginning, sometimes it's important to just be reminded of the things that we already know. So our verse for today is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And throughout this week, I want you to keep that verse in mind, to think through that verse, repeat that verse to yourself. Do some of the activities that we've done with memory verses in Sunday school. Write it on a piece of paper, cut it up, and build the puzzle. Come up with your own motions for the memory verse. If you don't already know that by heart, it's one that I would encourage you to take the time to learn. Because it is one of the most important reminders we can have. That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And hey, if you already know that verse, maybe work on verse 17. It says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world would be saved through him. God shows his power by sending Jesus to this world, by doing all of the things that Jesus did. He shows his power, but he shows his love by sending Jesus not to condemn the world, not to say that there's nothing good left, but to save the world, to save you and me, to claim us as his own, to say you're mine, no matter what you've done, no matter what the people around you have done, no matter what people have done to you, you are mine. And God says that to each and every one of us, and he's there waiting for you and me to turn, to turn back to him, to want him in our lives again, to let him be the king, to be living in the kingdom of this good, powerful, loving king. King Jesus, come. If you'll just stay on for a little bit longer, at 1030, we will have our main service. And like I said, tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock, I'll be on again. And I plan to be on each afternoon this week at that time with a shorter devotional. It won't be quite as long as this, probably five, maybe maybe ten minutes, with a short devotional and something that ties into what we're studying about Jesus, but isn't directly one of the stories from this time frame. So we, I would love to have you join me then, and I would especially love to have you join us for our service at 1030. And just have a wonderful week. God bless, and I'll see you in the comments.